I sat down and I watched a Netflix Jeffrey Epstein documentary. And I was about three episodes in and I was seeing these girls crying, saying how they couldn't break their silence because they were controlled by this powerful billionaire man who's connected to everyone. And I was like, I know how they feel as a 10 year old child. My granddad might as well have been a powerful billionaire man, you know, to a 10 year old child. He, he, he had that weight too. I, my name is Perry Power. I'm an actor, I'm an author, and I co-founded and co-run a charity called We Rescue Kids. So in short, I was sexually abused by my granddad for over a year and a half when I was 10 years old. And then I lived in silence through for, for over 12 years. And the reason why I broke my silence was because my dad, he became an alcoholic. He then died from a heart attack at the age of 48. That became my catalyst to then explore, gain awareness around me and why I'd made certain decisions, why he had made certain decisions. And then I chose to break my silence. And then that led to me creating a book called Breaking the Silence, which hit number one on Amazon, which is amazing. And now I'm turning that into a movie. Wow. Okay. I didn't, I didn't know about the movie part, but that's incredible. Uh, did I see in the book that it was... Uh... Uh, it wasn't just your story, but uh, uh, I guess uh, a collection of other uh, in experiences from other individuals as well. Correct. So the book is in three parts. So part one of the book is my story, breaking my silence. Part two of the book is 14 stories from 14 survivors of sexual abuse. Half of them are named. They're happy to have their name attached. The other half are unnamed, mainly because some of them are kids and teenagers. So it's very raw. Some of them are present and they're still happening and then part three of the book is how somebody who is living in silence how they can take the necessary steps to break that goodness that's absolutely harrowing i um, as i mentioned to you just before we started i this is not an experience that i um i have any kind of first-hand knowledge of and just the thought of it is absolutely harrowing that something like this could happen and you think about the whole familial connection so you mentioned that it was your granddad who was the abuser um this idea that your family are supposed to be there to protect you and to look after you and to keep you safe but uh, in in your in your instance, it was your granddad who was carrying out the abuse. Did um, at the time you so you mentioned on a Facebook post that your granddad made you feel as though this was okay. Like what sorts of things did he did he do to kind of make you feel that way? I think I think it was more so. Um, I think it was more so me rather as opposed to him, what he'd done to make me feel okay. I think it's because when I was 10 years old, so we're talking 16 years ago now, 16 years ago, sexual abuse wasn't a thing that was talked about on the news. It wasn't in the papers. It wasn't a, I mean, it's still, it's getting a lot better now, but about 16 years ago, it was nothing. So when I was 10 years old, I didn't even know what sexual abuse was. I didn't know it was a thing, right? And I just thought that the love that my granddad was showing me was just, I thought it was odd but I didn't think it was bad. I thought it was just a different type of love that he was expressing. So therefore I didn't know it was, I didn't know what he was doing. I needed to run to my dad and tell him what was going on. I didn't know it was that type of thing. And because he was my granddad, it's like, you know, you know, you, you respect your elders. So obviously he's not doing anything wrong. So it was more so that, and it, it was when my stepmom caught it, then my dad tried to hammer into me that what he was doing was actually wrong, Perry. Wow. So your stepmom actually, so she, how did, uh, did she walk in on um, an instance where your granddad was abusing you or did she overhear a conversation? How did she find out? So there was one time where there was a couple of us in the living room. I was on my granddad's lap. So I was 10, I was watching TV and we was on a single armchair watching a TV. Now there's a sofa behind, but because of the way the sofa that me and my granddad were sitting in was situated, you couldn't see really the front of us right you can just kind of see like the back of us on the couch my stepmom was on the other couch she we was all watching eggheads on tv and my granddad my he used to smoke roll-up cigarettes so he would have his hand over the arm of the couch and then she was watching tv and then the cigarette drops onto the floor 
and she's just assuming that he's going to lean over and pick it up. She's, so she's carrying on watching TV. Moments go by and he hasn't leant over to pick up the cigarette yet. And now it's burning a hole into the carpet. And she's watching us, thinking, why on earth is he not leaning over? And she, she, she never saw anything, but she said that her spidey senses just completely went off. So she stood up, went out the living room, called me. She called my dad in. And then on a journey home, my dad was questioning me, saying, what on earth is going on? What's going on? And then I told them about that incident. I don't remember any of that. That's a story that my stepmom told me after I spoke out. Uh, but from then on, uh, because they knew what was going on, they I wasn't allowed to go back around there to go and see them until he passed away two years later. Then I could start going back around there and see my nan again. Well, goodness. Um, and I... I have to say it's amazing that your stepmom was able to recognize that and take steps to to protect you in that moment. I think often there's a tendency for, especially when there's a family member involved, to be to to kind of say, actually, no, you know, you're lying. This didn't happen. Um, you know, yeah. what what you think happened was was not what actually happened. Uh, was the police involved at all? Did anyone um, call the authorities? No, and. It it make it will make sense when, when I I dropped the bombshell, which is that what after I, after I broke my silence, which was about four years ago, I find out that it was my auntie, my cousin, and also my dad were victims of abuse from the same man. So it was like a generational cycle of abuse. So my dad grew up being sexually abused by him. He then lived in silence. He then finds out that his son was abused by the same man. So I'm assuming there's a, there was a lot of uh, guilt from him. And he then chose to turn to the bottle of alcohol. And then when he passed away, it, it made me realize why nobody spoke out. Because there was multiple people. And that's the thing when you're abused, you know, you do have the options. You have that front door in the house to walk out. But it's almost as if like that, that door isn't there because you don't feel like you can walk out. So nobody told the police and especially because he died two years after. He died from a heart attack at work. So he died when I was 14. And then there's no point in taking it to the authorities. Nothing really would have happened. How did your dad's, uh, your dad passing away, how did that affect you? Did Were you, were you really close with him um, at the time? Yeah, me and my dad were best friends. Uh, my my mum, biological mother, she walked out when I was four. So it was just me and my dad. He raised me. Then my stepmom came into the picture a few years later and I was the best man at their wedding and growing up I was his best mate and we were very close. We we grew a tad, a tad distant, but only not a great deal, but a tad distant when I moved out because growing up my dad, he, he parented me in a way that he wanted to be parented when he grew up. So when he grew up at his house with his mom and his stepdad, which is my step granddad, the one who, who did the abuser, they were alcoholics. So they would be at the pub every single day. When they'd come home, he needed to order, have the dinner cooked, the house cleaned and everything for them. And if he wasn't to be at home, they wouldn't be like, where is he? Where's, where is, you know, where's my dad? They would be like, where's the dinner? You know, so they never showed him the love that he wanted. So me growing up, I had to give him the addresses of all of my friends. I had to tell him what time I was going to be there, what time I was going to be home. If I was late, I would be grounded. And I'd only have pen and paper in my bedroom. Like it was very strict rules. And so when I was 19 years old, I moved out because I needed to spread my wings and make my own mistakes. And when he passed away, for sure, uh, it was it was very tough. One of the toughest things I've been through It's very surreal. For you, you watch movies and you see the character's parents die and it's obviously tragic you can never truly, truly, truly relate to it until you've gone through that, a parent of yours passing, especially at a young age, not if they're 80, 90, and you know they're on their way out soon, when they're 48 and they just drop dead very randomly. And mm. it took me, every day is different, but it took me about seven or eight months before I started to get the ball, the ball in motion to start focusing on my story and his story and trying to connect the dots. Yeah. Did... Uh, did your dad, so you mentioned that after it was discovered that your granddad was abusing you, your dad spent some time, you know, basically 
telling you that what happened was wrong. Yeah. Um, your granddad shouldn't have done this. Did you have any like conversations with him during this this period around kind of um, how you felt? So not just the what happened to you, but how it was impacting you and how you were feeling about it. No, he didn't want to talk about it. He never wanted to talk yeah. about it. Yeah. Even when I was in my late teenager years and I'd bring it up, uh, he, he would just shut me down straight away. He didn't want to talk about it. Now it makes sense because it, he was a victim too, you know? So if we were talking about it in regards to me, we was also talking about it in regards to him, which meant that that conversation was forcing him to confront his own story and his own demons as a man, you know? And he, my, my dad was a very typical man's man. You don't see him cry. You throw his mm. fists if you're trying to, you know, if you're trying to um, shatter his masculinity in the way, you know, and what he thought it was. And so when it came to something that was as raw and as vulnerable as abuse, that to him was a no-go. And I know that's the point in this podcast. That's what we're doing. We're talking to, to men and we're trying to combat this and get rid of that stigma. But my dad was literally the epitome, the absolute epitome. We, When he was an alcoholic, we sent him to AA meetings. He went to the first one or the first two and lied to us about the rest of the night he was going to. And it was because my dad had a tough time admitting that he had a problem. Because if he admitted mm. he had a problem, that meant he was weak and he didn't need to ask for help. Yeah. And it's, it's such a sad situation being a victim of sexual abuse and then having that victimhood reinforced by not feeling as though you can confront that, that you can seek help that you can even admit that you know that that was something that happened yeah for sure um, is when you're i say a lot that the consequences of living in silence far outweigh the consequences of breaking that silence and when you're living in silence you are constantly reinforcing um that victim mentality that victimhood you're reinforcing those traumas there's a book called the body keeps a score i can't um vessa i can't remember the guy who wrote it but it's a fantastic book and it talks about how when we have experienced trauma, everybody's experienced trauma in, in some way. It doesn't mean you need to have been abused. And even so, there's a, I, I, the majority of people, I would say, have experienced abuse of some kind. Not necessarily sexually, but emotionally or mentally. And when, when, and when we're experiencing those, they create wounds on us, right? Open wounds. And if we don't focus on, on healing those wounds, then then they infect everything within us like a plague. And that is what happens beneath the surface when you're living in silence until it erupts like a volcano and then it takes over everything. And that everything is like coping mechanisms like alcohol abuse and drug abuse and things like that to manage those demons. Yeah. Um, I just had a quick Google search. The The book is uh, The Body Keeps a Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Bessel, um, yeah. Yeah, well, I have a I have a read of that. It looks really oh, interesting, a, actually. That book is a is a is crazy, crazy because he he was the one who like pioneered back in the day where if somebody had experienced trauma, somebody had experienced abuse, the back then it was just give them medication. You know, they got PTSD, just give them medication. He was the one who was like, no, it's more than that. You know, it's more than that. He's the one who kind of like pioneered therapy. Um, so that book is absolutely crazy crazy good yeah okay I'll, I'll definitely have a look at it um so when so you mentioned that at the time you didn't realize what your dad was dealing with so his his own um his own issues and and the the abuse that he suffered at the hands of your granddad did you feel any sense of betrayal in those moments by him not willing to talk about what had happened to you or to, I guess in, it, there might have been a sense of you crying out for, you know, for help, help me like rationalize this, help me come to terms with it, understand it, but he wasn't really able to give you that support that you needed? I think, I think it's a very valid question. I think for me, so it, so it stopped when I was 11. And then throughout those school years, um, it never it never affected me in a way where I was crying out for help and I wanted uh, conversations about it with my dad. And that was because I just didn't, I just put it to the back of my mind. I think because I still didn't truly understand the weight of what was going on, of what happened. 
especially as I was like 12, 13. And because I never spoke about it to my friends at school, my dad was like a forbidden conversation in the house. So it was always as if like, okay, that was someone else's story. You know, I, I can't bring it up to anybody. Else, so that's someone else's story. And because I didn't truly, it, it changed when I was about 15, 16. And I got into my late teenager years. That's when things started to shift because it become more of a conversational topic amongst people on the news, in papers. And then the more present the, the, the topic of abuse was, the more it, it forced me to go back to that story and confront that story. And the more times that I've done that, then that is when the shame built. That's when um, I blamed myself. And, I, and then that is when the actual problems that maybe should have started when I was that age, but I don't think I had the emotional maturity when I was 12, 13 years old to know what was going on. Is when that emotional maturity started to be built. That's when the effects started to take place. And you talk about blaming yourself there. And that's that's something that I hear a lot of um, individuals who have experienced uh, abuse of any kind, um, sexual abuse and, and physical abuse. They, they, they talk about that sense of blaming themselves because um, most victims don't resist physically. Um, I, I guess it's... And it's not because they wanted it. It's, you know, in, in a lot of times, often the, the perpetrator of abuse is someone who's known, is known to the family. And there's that element of manipulation to, to, to um, and I guess because also the, the individual is known to the family, it, it, you know, you wonder, am I going to be believed? Um, it, are they going to take that person's side over mine, even if they do? acknowledge that something happened is it just going to be swept under the under the rug um and you know feeling as though you might have had some part to play in it which is of course completely false if you know anyone who has suffered abuse it's it's never their fault it's it's always the abuser's fault um and they should be held responsible um but how did those feelings of guilt affect you? Did was it something as as you know you got older over time and recognizing, uh, you know, looking back at the situation, was it something that that really affected you going into your later teen years? For sure. So I was born and raised in London, and the older I got, the more. Growing up, I was. An introverted kid I wasn't confident I wasn't like a lad around the mates and I, I was still a virgin I wasn't good with girls not it's so none of that right but I, 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 I didn't want to be that way right so it's not like I was happy with that and that's okay I didn't want to be I wanted to be confident I wanted to be extroverted I wanted to be good with girls and I wanted to have a, a group of guy mates um, that were so that were out there you know and and I wasn't getting that. And that was because, to me, my identity was I was a boy who was abused by his granddad. Now, growing up, I didn't have that identity. And this was mentioned before. The more it was um, present in the media, the more I visited my story, then that identity took place that I am the boy who was abused by his granddad. So that impacted a lot of things. Now, when my nan passed away, my parents sold my nan's house. And with that money, they decided to move out of London and move to a place... Um, we mo- at the time they moved to Bracknell in Berkshire so then I was like okay so I'm moving to a new place where nobody knows me so what I'd done and this is the actor in me I created a character a character of Perry Power who's super confident he's been he's he's slept with loads of girls he's got loads of guy mates he doesn't he doesn't give doesn't give a shit about anything right and he just he's that type of person and and it worked and I faked it until I made it and then that became my new identity so, and I, and I did that because I so badly just wanted, I didn't want to be that version of myself anymore, right? I wanted to just shed that identity. I wanted to shed that, that shame and I wanted to shed the guilt. But looking back, I wasn't shedding the shame and shedding the guilt. That was always there. Hence why I created this new character. So, and this is the thing, you're still, I'm still, I was still running away from it rather than standing and confronting, you know? So that's that's my experience in regards to the, the the shame, the fear, and the guilt. Yeah, and and you mentioned there about this idea of wearing a mask and being afraid to kind of show the real you. And I think it's very important, at, at least from my perspective, to say that uh, if you have been, uh, if you have experienced abuse, abuse is not your identity. 
like you aren't just the person who better be there's so many other facets to who you are and who you can become it's 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 something that has happened to you but it's not who you are uh, and i think sometimes we we live in a society that really kind of fixates on putting labels on people and classifying them as one thing um you're an abuse victim and that's it and i think that's really unfair to to people who are struggling with this and and being able to recognize that actually you know what there is so much more to me um, yeah yeah it's it's true there is you know your your story doesn't define you like you, what you've been through doesn't doesn't you aren't it's, it's a fragment of who you are but it's not who you are as a whole because then that enforces that you can't necessarily shift and change yeah you are set like you are programmed to the story you've already lived and and that just that just keeps you that keeps you in the past keeps you locked so and that's exactly what was happening to my dad he he was never present in the moment he was never futuristic he was all in the past i've been mean, behind yeah um after this um, after it became more widely known within your family um what was that like for you at that time so so i guess it was kind of like this this secret that people sort of knew but didn't really talk about but when it did become more of an open thing um how did you how did you deal with that so i it all started when when lewis house brought out mask and masculinity and he was on the ellen degeneres show and he was talking about the alpha mask that he used to wear because he was also um uh, a victim of sexual abuse as a boy and when he was describing the masks that he was wearing it made me realize that these masks which i was talking about earlier as in the character that i created the terminology he's using as masks and and then that's when i decided to shed that and at the time i told my girlfriend um about about the this fake person that he that she fell in love with she fell in love with this player and i wasn't I wasn't the, uh, it wasn't all the truth. And then from there, I then told her about the abuse. And then about six months later, I then told four people at a business mastermind conference uh, about it. And then driving home, I then did a video and put it onto Facebook. And it was only when I put that video onto Facebook, it was when I then found out. So my stepmom, when I went back around to the family home, she said to me that the time that she caught in that living room, she thought that was the only time it happened. Everyone did. Thought that was the only time that it happened. That's because in the car driving home, that's what I must have told my dad. I must have, I must have kept hidden all of the other times. And then when I went around to my auntie's house, after the back, uh, from, from watching that video, she then told me about my cousin, who, was, who which I already knew about because she'd already told me because she practically like my sister. So I knew that growing up anyway. And my auntie... And then my my dad. So it's crazy. So I, when I first broke my silence, I was of course I was I was fearful what people would think. I was fearful what people would say because living in silence for so long, I had this perception of the world on what I thought it would be like once I shared my story, and that'd be people laughing, people ignoring, like I don't want to know that story, right? People saying that I am. Um, just just a whole host of things and basically just a fear of rejection a fear of being outcasted but then once i shared my story i realized just that external world was just a reflection of my internal world and that external world is actually a beautiful place with beautiful people in it who are loving who are warm who are welcoming whether i'm a man or a woman it doesn't matter on the gender right it's just about being vulnerable and being open and being honest and then when i experienced that you can call it a transformation then that is when I started to take it seriously to consistently share my story and help other people, especially men, do the same thing. Because I've seen firsthand the impact it can have for a man to live in silence. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you mentioned there about putting doing a Facebook video and putting that out there. That must have taken incredible courage I, I can't imagine how scared like leading up to that moment you would have been i just i think about if i was to 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 you know put uh, put something out there onto the you know onto facebook something that that i had felt 
deep shame about something that I'd been told to to keep secret for so many years. Um, and yeah, I, I can't, what, how did you find the courage to do that? I think what, what helped was when I went to this mastermind event, it was a five day mastermind event for fitness professionals. Cause I was a fitness coach, um, a few years ago. And when I was there, I shared my story with four people, but I didn't, these were strangers and how they welcomed me after that really made me think more people will be this welcoming, you know? So when I was driving home, I was like, right, I need to tell my friends. I need to tell my family. But then to be honest, I didn't want to start having to call up people one by one by one, explain the story over and over. Cause at that time it was still raw. Now I can tell a million times in a day and I do, but then I couldn't have done that. So I just wanted to do like a shotgun effect where I can just tell everybody at once. And because I practically lived on social media at the time, and I still do in a way, I was like, well, the best way is to put it on a video. And I was like, right. So when I get home, I'll do it. And I'm driving and I'm thinking, no, 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 no. Because if you wait another half an hour until you get home, you'll talk yourself out of it. As soon as you walk back into your the doors of your house, you're back into your comfort zone. You won't do it. You'll find a reason not to do it. So I literally pulled over um, straight away into the next road, got my phone out, it took me seven takes. So in your question, was it difficult? It bloody was. It took me seven takes to do it. Um, I was crying in the first couple of them, but I didn't upload that because I didn't want people to see me cry. Still that, that is still that man, the man thing in my head, right? And yeah, it, it took me seven takes. And on that seventh take, I just uploaded it. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, Jesus, Perry, what have you done? And in that inner dialogue on my head, people are not going to, they've gone into Facebook to watch funny things, right? To check in on their mates, what coffee they're drinking, not to watch your video about being abused as a child. And all these things started to come into my head. And, I, and then I looked at my phone and there was 60 views, roughly two comments. So my mind was like, so that means 58 people have watched it and not commented yet. So that means they're sitting there and they're laughing at you on that video. And I was going to delete it, but, and I, but I knew that that was just my internal dialogue. That wasn't me. So I just threw, I literally threw my phone behind my shoulder into the back of the car so I couldn't reach it and just started driving, right? So I can fight against that inner dialogue. And then when I got to my house about 30 minutes later, I cracked the music up on driving home to try not to think about it. And then when I pulled up outside my house, I went and got my phone and then I saw hundreds of comments, likes, messages, not one single negative comment. That's amazing that um, you had people on your Facebook who were able to, I guess, provide you with that support. And because there are some really vile people in this world who will, you know, just for the sake of just be trolls. Um, you, you mentioned something there, which I found really interesting because it, it sort of tapped into something I was feeling about doing this recording. So this idea of being almost forced to relive your trauma um, multiple times for other people's consumption. And I was a little bit conflicted about, about um, doing this, this, um, this episode because I, I don't want to put you in that position and I don't want to put people in that position. But um, at, on the other hand, I think there is, um, and certainly as you were willing to come on, I think there is benefit in, in sharing this because as you know, as as we mentioned before, there there are so many people who are living in silence. Um, and from the work that you've done on your book, there's so many people who are still going through these experiences. And for them to hear and know that they're not the only ones, um, you know, the 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 feelings around guilt and shame, it's it's not unique to them. And absolutely it's not their fault. And they don't have to feel guilt and they don't have to feel, feel shame about what's happening to them and what's happened to them. Um, but there, there are people out there to help and support them to, to kind of come out of the situation and to, to overcome it as, as best you can. Um, yeah, which, which uh, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate you saying that because somebody said to me, it's like, but they asked me two questions. One was like, are you not sick and tired of, of telling your story yet? <laughs> right? Because I share it multiple times every single day. And I've done that for nearly four years now. And it's going to continue to be like that, especially with how this book is going. And with the movie, it's only going to grow. And that is okay. And 
I want, here's the thing, it's a choice. We all have a choice at the end of the day. If I didn't want to share my story so much, I wouldn't be doing it. It's as simple as that. But I, but I want to. And because I, because I, I fully have healed um, and I've owned my story, I found acceptance. I found forgiveness over everything that happened over my step granddad. It's so when I revisit it, I don't feel like I'm opening up. I don't feel like I'm putting light on any open wounds that are still there to make it uncomfortable for me, which is great that wouldn't be the case if if um if I still hadn't healed and lastly is that I know I know that every time I share my story and somebody's listening who's living in silence I know the potential of how much it can impact them and that is what gets me out of bed every single morning and do this all day every single day because of exactly that Mm, silly and yeah, I, I, I'm really glad that you have been able to do that because I know there are so many people who who will benefit from from what you are doing. Um, so you mentioned the healing process. What? So obviously you've been sharing your story, and you know you you found the courage to tell the people who are closest to you, and then you you put it out on Facebook, um, and you've uh, you know been doing other work with with your charity. Like what what did healing specifically look like for you? How did you, what was the journey like for you to overcome, um, overcome that trauma? Did you need to go to therapy or was there more kind of internal things that you did on your own? It was mainly internal work on my own. As I grew older, and I myself got rid of the stigma around therapy. Like I've just moved location and I've moved to Guildford and and I'm currently looking for a therapist to start working with again whilst I'm here for the long term. Because I truly believe that every single person on the planet should have a therapist. You do not need to have a problem or an issue for you to go to therapy. I believe the happiest person in the world should still have a therapist because of because it's just about those conversations that you have in every week with your therapist. That is what it's all about. And it's a stigma around therapy that people are like, you know, oh, I'll go to therapy. Oh, okay. Well, what problems do you have? Are you okay? It's gonna be, you know, it's nothing to do, it's nothing to do with that. Well, growing up, and especially uh when I was talking about broke out of my silence, I I was in a way still living within that stigma of therapy. I didn't believe I needed a therapist. There's still a bit of the whole that masculinity thing, you know, I don't really need a therapist. I can do this stuff on my own type of thing. But it forced me though to look inwards and it forced me to figure out how can I move forward. And it started with um, a friend of mine, he lost his dad. And he said to me that the way he got through it was forgiveness. So I worked on forgiving myself for the text that I never responded back to. Worked on forgiving my dad for the, the things that he would say to me in the heat of the moment or in an argument. And, and then once that worked, I then focused on forgiving myself for not speaking out as a child during the abuse. And there is no like step by step on how you can find forgiveness. It's more so just allowing it to come to you and just building up the awareness of saying, it's okay that I didn't speak out. The reason why I didn't speak out is because of X, Y, and Z, right? So you give me like you, you're, you're finding Here's why I didn't speak out. And if you truly believe that that reason is why you didn't speak out, then you're forgiving yourself because you didn't, I didn't know any better as a child, right? Now, when it came to my granddad, I chose to forgive him because sure, I can forgive myself, but then if I see a picture of him, it's going to stir negative emotions within, within me because I said that he's still got something wrapped around me. He's still got a chain around me that's holding me back. So I worked on forgiving him. Now, the way that I'd done that was by knowing that people aren't born racist. People aren't born wanting to abuse children, right? It's something that happens through conditioning, whether it's through parenting, whether it's through society, whether it's through something happening to you that's caused these wounds that you have not um, that you have not healed. So then you're inflicting that pain onto others. That is your coping mechanism. And I knew something was like that with, with my granddad. So, and it's interesting because when this, if anybody listening hasn't seen this film, you need to see it. It's called Spotlight. And it, it won Grammys, it won Oscars, it won Best Picture, everything going. And it's about these team of journalists in Boston. I can't remember which year it is. It's either the 60s or 70s. They get a whiff of a case of a priest molesting a child. 
And then they dive into the case and then there's priests all over the world missing children all over the world. And my dad told me that just before the credits, when they show up, all of these Catholic priests uh, or Catholic churches all around the world of priests molesting children, that the school that my granddad grew up in in Ireland is listing, listed in that movie of having reported cases. So when I was able to build up this awareness and understand, okay, so my granddad grew up being abused by priests, him and his brother, then and he never spoke out, he never seeked help. He grew up living in silence and he inflicted that onto multiple people. My dad grew up in silence. He could have taken the path of inflicting it onto other people like like his stepdad did, but he did it. He instead inflicted that pain onto himself. And it's just, and that, that is how I healed in answer to your question is I can, there's, there's many different things, owning your story, uh, self-love, you, you know, and these, these are things that I cover in my book, but the main thing, the main thing is owning your story so realizing that it actually happened to stop running away from it confront it stand in front of that person in the mirror and then finding forgiveness forgiveness for me was the was the diamond it was the gold is what allowed me to move forward yeah and that's so powerful i think this being able to forgive because i i, f- I fully believe that forgiveness is more about you and your own road to healing than it is about the other person i think there's a tendency we feel sometimes like like if i forgive him then or if i give the person who who had done something wrong to me then i'm letting them off the hook but it's not about them it's about you and yeah, yeah I, I, I say that in my book i say you'll find here's the thing right you'll find somebody who's been through something that's tragic so let's just say you have somebody who's was raped for three years by her uncle right but like really bad and then she's hearing me and i said i forgave my granddad and i recommend people to do the same thing she can feel like i'm attacking her how dare you tell me that i should forgive my uncle for raping me for over three years and i and i understand i understand very very well i i shouldn't forgive not just for me because he did worse things to other people in my family than he done to me right? He was an abuser in every right, emotional, mentally, physically, sexually. So he doesn't deserve forgiveness. But here's a, th- here's a key thing. He doesn't deserve it, right? But the whole point of this is it's not about them. I'm not giving them a get out of jail free card, I'm not letting them off the hook, like you rightly said, Jamie. I'm forgiving them because I'm too damn beautiful, powerful, courageous of a human being to still be held back by that person's actions, especially when my granddad died two, year- two years after I was 14. And he was still, I was still under his spell. I was still held, held back by him. He still had power over me when he's six feet under, <laughs> right? So when I was thinking about that, I was like, geez, no, absolutely not. You know what? I forgive you. If you was alive today, I'll sit down with you. I'll have a coffee with you. I'll understand. Dude, talk to me about your story, man. What happened between us? Forget it, like, just for this right now. Forget about it. Talk to me about your story. And I would. I would. If he was alive today, I, pr- I would probably have put him in the book, you know? Um, and, and I think just, if you can come from, if you can come from pain, trying to put yourself in that person's shoes, not to excuse them for what they've done, but to just try to gain an understanding, I can very much assure you, I can very much assure you, sorry, um, that you'll be able to move forward positively. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I want to talk a little bit about the book, um, Breaking the Silence. So you, what was that, what was the process of writing that like for you? I, I guess by the time you, you sat down and put pen to paper, you, you had gotten to a point in your life where you felt more comfortable sharing these experiences and knew that actually, you know what, I, I have a mission here to, to help other people as well. Um, how did you, what was the process like of writing that and then also having those interviews with the individuals who participated in it? Yes. So about a year and a half ago, I took to TikTok because I wanted my story to be in front of kids and teenagers and my videos then blew up. Uh, my highest videos, 5.9 million views. I got about 125,000 followers on there. Most of them are victims of sexual abuse. And a lot of them come from the TikTok platform and message me on Instagram and share with me their story. So I was going back and forth with these kids for, for ages. And, and 
that's what led me to co-founding uh, my charity, We Rescue Kids. There's two other co-founders, Julia and Sam, is because we all wanted a way. We've all got experience with abuse. Sam doesn't, but he he knows people who has. Juliet was born uh, and raised in a foster care home where she was tortured and raped um, through, by a list of clientele that the foster parents would sell the kids to for that time slot. And so she has a very close uh, uh, connection in regards to sorting out the foster care system. And we wanted to come together and try to create something, hence a charity. And then further from that, in the first lockdown last year to March here in the UK, I sat down and I watched a Netflix Jeffrey Epstein documentary. And I was about three episodes in and I was seeing these girls crying, saying how they couldn't break their silence because they were controlled by this powerful billionaire man who's connected to everyone. And I was like, I was like, I need to get this book out. I know how they feel as a 10 year old child. My granddad might as well have been a powerful billionaire man, you know, to a 10 year old child. He, he, he had that weight too. And so I then got to work on the book and then it took me a few weeks to get the book together. And it was, it was an interesting process. It was fine. It, it, it was a great process because I've shared my story so many times before doing that book. And that book was just a different way of telling my story. And then I reached out to some of uh, a handful of people on my IG uh, messages from people from TikTok. And I asked them if they wanted to be in the book. Some of them said no. They're too scared to. And some of them said yes. And then I got them to, I didn't do an interview, like a video interview or anything like that, because to try and get a 12 year old on a video call when they're living at home with their abuser is not a, an easy thing to do. And there's a lot of legality issues with that. So instead, I just got them to send me over like a Google Doc or to send me a voice note or to send me a message with their story. And then I'll put it inside of the book. And then a year later, I then uh, launched it. It was about three weeks ago. Well, it's crazy just how prevalent this is. I, I, I really believe that this is one of those things in society that we just don't know how deep it goes. Um, it's, it's almost like an iceberg. You, you just see the tip um, and there's this whole hidden monolith underneath that we haven't actually taken the time to scratch the surface off and really uncover. Um, and it's, it's such a shame. So I, um, I completely, you know, I have so much respect for what you're doing with your charity and for what you've done, uh, with your book and sharing your story. Um, your charity, we rescue kids. How, um, what mechanisms do you use to, to help these abused children? Do you involve authorities, um, social workers, like how, how do you, what, what sorts of things do you do to assess? Yeah, so we're about a year and a half in, which for a charity is very, very early. We should have had our nonprofit status yet, but as soon as the pandemic hit, everyone, every charity who's still waiting to be greenlit legally, uh, nonprofit status wise, is all been backlogged. So we're still waiting. We could be waiting for uh, probably uh, another six months, hopefully not as long as that. So there's still only certain things we can do as a charity until we're nonprofit status. So next year, once that's been greenlit, we'll be opening up our first. So it's, a, it's American registered because my two co-founders are American. And once it's greenlit officially, then I'm going to be bringing it over to here in the UK. So that's what I'm waiting for on my end. But next year, we're going to be opening up our first safe home. So we've already got kids in the US um, foster care system who have kids ready to put into a first safe home of ours. And what we've done we've had to pivot since the pandemic to try and bring in an online segment an online way of helping into the charity so now which actually launched monday this week is we have a really really awesome awesome um sponsor a child campaign so what you can do is every month for about three to four hundred dollars that's if you want to pay for it all for a child or you can do as much as you want and you and a group of people put your money together to then sponsor one child, if that makes sense. And what you're sponsoring for is for this child to have therapy with a child therapist, registered child therapist every single month for 12 months. So you're you're sponsoring a child who ha who is a victim of sexual abuse, who their parents have put them forward 
to our campaign to be considered for this therapy and you're paying for them to be looked after and cared for through uh, therapeutic services for for 12 months and that's such a beautiful thing the response from it has been insane so far which is great and it's only it's only going to escalate our our big vision is to have a part of our charity that's boots on the ground so we intercept uh, child sex trafficking rings that are going across border and we go and rescue those kids and we bring them into our safe homes that are located around the country and then and then once they're in our care we then give them the education we need to give them the tools we give them the services to heal to grow and then we find them a really good family which will be having one of the best vetting systems in the world for to then go into their care oh, that that sounds absolutely incredible and i i i just really can't believe that stuff like this doesn't already happen i remember watching um a movie a while back it's called the whistleblower so it's from 2010 uh it starred rachel weiss so she played it it's a, it's based on a true story so she played um a um a un peacekeeper i believe in in bosnia in the bosnian war and discovered a sex uh, trafficking ring she realized that the UN was participating or members, members of the peacekeeping force were participating in this sex trafficking ring. And, you know, she set out to, to, to say, no, like this, you know, this can't happen. And the, the backlash that she got for it and, and the obstacles that were put in her way to, to stop her. Um, have you experienced any um, kind of obstacles or barriers to to getting some of this off the ground have have people told you actually you know don't do this it's a terrible idea or you know you're going to put yourself in danger um or anything like that yeah in the beginning 95 percent of its support we have had five percent of like the five percent of people who would say either a charity is a lot of hard work are you sure you want to do that when there's already charities out there but that doesn't mean anything. There's a lot of anything out there. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing it, right? And and I tell you now, there's more children than there are fun uh, like space in charities. To, to you know, you need as many charities as you can get for the amount of children that are out there. Especially in in, in our case, we've had but we've had people that would make comments like that. But it's just you know, it's just those negative trollers who just says something to just get a couple likes on on the post type of thing. But yeah. th- thankfully and luckily, they've been very, very. F- we haven't had any. F- the more, le- like, the more we've been doing with this charity, that like in our first four weeks, probably yeah, it's probably like a first month or two months, we'd have a couple comments. You know, how do we know where the money's going? You're brand new. You know, you're not even registered. That type of thing. And then as we got mm-hmm. registered and as it, things started to snowball, we haven't had a single comment that's like that, which is great. Yeah, I I think you're always going to have people who who are a bit of nice hairs, but like all all I all I can say is, um, you know, if if you've got the the vision to do something and you're doing good, um, go for it. Yeah. Um, how how did you come into contact with your co-founders? You mentioned that um, one of them was uh, she was I, I guess you could call it part of a sex trafficking ring. Um, she she was a victim of that. How did you come into contact with them? Um, I've been connected with Juliet for a while. She's because uh, I've been in entrepreneurship for seven years, and she was like she won awards. She was like a millionaire by the age of twenty. She won San Diego's Best Businesswoman of the Year award. So she's very successful. And and I originally got in contact with her. I started following her uh, just out of like admiration and and for for business wise. But then we started to build a relationship, and then we actually started to become really really good friends. Um, it's because of our stories, because we was able to connect and because of our visions of wanting to help children who are just like us. And then I found out that she had already started to get the ball rolling on a charity. And she and we were talking about like me with all the TikTok messages and, and all of that. And I was like, I, I want to do more than what I'm doing here. And then cutting the story short, we just made a, a decision that it made sense for us to partner up. And then Sam uh used to work with Juliet as a client and he's very good at tech stuff he's very good at funnels he's very good at all of the back end stuff especially something like a charity of a business so um so he came on board and then that's us three oh okay no that's um yeah that sounds sounds really amazing it, it sounds like you've got some you know uh, alongside yourself some really uh, amazing minds to, to help drive this forward um yeah. with with um 
So with your experiences and your journey so far, where do you, what's, what's next for you? So obviously you're doing, you've got the book coming out, you're, you're, the, the movie is being, um, I guess, in talks for production. Yeah, and yeah, it's charity. in talks. Yeah, so I've already, got, um, I've already got a lot of crew ready, ready and waiting. I yesterday got backed by a producer, which is amazing um because the producer can help with the festivals producer can help with getting the funding and there's just a lot of people that have come together who wants to make this happen and what's really cool i say cool but it is cool in a way is that a lot of the people that actually want to be as part of the cast and crew are also victims of sexual abuse so how amazing is that where a movie is created by victims and it's made for not only victims, but it's made for the world. And that's why I see once this movie is done, you best believe it's going to be on streaming channels. You best believe it's going to be on Netflix. You best believe it's going to be everywhere because I want to be pushing out to Hollywood because of how rife abuse is in Hollywood. Um, yeah. So I want to be pushing this movie with the help of all these amazing people that wants to be involved all the way to the top so everybody can see it. And it can create this worldwide movement of hashtag break the silence. Absolutely. We've, I mean, we've just seen, you know, instances with people like Harvey Weinstein who, yeah. you know, would use use sexual favors for power. So, so for individuals who may have, uh, who are victims of sexual abuse, who who suspect sexual abuse is going on, um, what? How can someone get in contact with you? How can they, if they wanted to come on board and and help or support, or if they just wanted to get in contact for you know for support for themselves, how can they get in touch? Sure. So, the either Facebook or Instagram. I'm literally fifty fifty on those. Um, I.e. activity wise. So whatever works for you. Uh, Facebook Perry W Perry dot W dot Power. Uh, on Instagram is I am Perry Power. It's the easiest name to remember. So you can definitely hit me up and message me whether you want to um, get on board with a charity. We're always looking for people to volunteer in any way, shape, and form. Uh, we're going to be soon getting to the point of board members, so it's actually scaling really nice. So there's always going to be work for people who want to be part of the charity. Um, you can check out the charity, which is WeRescueKids.org. Uh, you could check out my book. So if you're if you're somebody who's living in silence or you know somebody who is living in silence then you can check out my book which is on amazon it's available as a ebook or a paperback and all profits of the book goes to charity talk to me nice talk to me honestly 